All right, hello and welcome to our third and final Convos in Cohort uh, conversation for 2022. And I'll invite Emily Moon to start us off with a land acknowledgement. We are curating this conversation from Portland, Oregon, traditional and ancestral lands stolen from the Multnomah, Clackamas, Chinook, Kathlamet, Tualatin Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes and bands of the Columbia and Willamette regions. We respect that acknowledging indigenous people as the original stewards of these lands since time immemorial is not enough. Action and investment are required. May this recognition of harm seed communal roots of active engagement and relationship building toward healing the ongoing traumas of settler colonialism. Great, thanks, Emily. Um, I thought I would introduce who we are. We're First Matter Press, and you can see our beautiful book covers here. And I thought I would just tell you a little bit about our press. First Matter Press is a writer's collective in Portland, Oregon, founded in 2018 to dissolve publication barriers for first-time publishing poets and genre-expanding authors. The 17 titles available or in production our release is coming up next month, um, and then they'll all be available. Our annual releases center community and craft by inviting authors into creative cohort, where they crystallize manuscripts and dialogue with editors and fellow writers and collaborate with featured artists on original cover art. First Matter Press is a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our authors maintain 100% copyright and sales proceeds for their published works. Our current editors include Ash Good, Lauren Paredes, Caroline Wilcox-Royal, and Emily Moon. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I just wanna take a, a second to introduce our 2022 cohort. It consists of five books of poetry and genre of expanding literature. Um, Between These Borders Wanders a Golem by ah Ahuva S. Zaslavsky. One Row After, Bear Sarasonra by Sonia Wolitz. Stories for When the Wolves Arrive by Haley Spencer. Someone I Can Hold Gently by Xylophone Mickland. And Even the Air Too Heavy by Riley Danvers. And we were just completely blessed to work with Rachel Mulder this year on these outstanding covers. Rachel is an artist here in Portland, Oregon. You can find her on Instagram at um, her hashtags here on the screen, or, or um, you could search Rachel Mulder. <laughs> All right, so Combos and Cohort is a series that we developed to allow our authors to kind of um, be in public dialogue in the same way that they're in dialogue in our workshops. And so in these series, we um, have selected a theme for each one. And if you miss conversation one or conversation two, you can find those on our YouTube channel, along with an assortment of really great recordings of poetry from all of our authors. Um, but here in conversation three, we're going to be focusing on poetry and prose essential differences. And the three authors we have here today to read and discuss are Riley Danvers, Sonia Wolitz, and Haley Spencer. So we're looking forward to hearing them read. Um, just in terms of a little bit of housekeeping for the event. If you have questions that you'd like to see addressed in the conversation that'll happen after their readings, feel free to drop those in the chat if you're here with us on the Zoom, or we'll also be monitoring the Facebook Live. So if you add your questions or comments there, our editors can pull them into the conversation. Um, if you're here with us in the Zoom, feel free to re reflect back any lines that you um, really hear that really hit your ear and it's down outstanding to you. You can type those into the chat or over on Facebook. If you want to capture any of those really stellar lines, feel free to leave them as comments. Um, and uh, we also have the commenting buttons here in Zoom if you want to use the hearts, the claps, things like that and the poets could also see your videos while they're reading. So if you want to, you know, give a little poetry snap, give a thumbs up, anything that speaks to you, it's great to be able to communicate a little bit online while we're sharing our poetry. I think that's it for now. Does uh, Caroline or Emily, do you have anything else to add? You ready to get started? 
All right. So I'm going to bring us to our first poet who will read tonight. Emily, would you like to introduce Haley? How did we lose Emily? Maybe we lost Emily. Oh, there she is. <laughs> my, sorry, my computer was not cooperating briefly. Glad Just, to have you back. Yeah, great. Pardon me? I said, glad to have you back. <laughs> It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce Stories for When the Wolves Arrive by Haley Spencer. Stories for When the Wolves Arrive is both an academic and psychological exploration into the deeper themes behind our best known fairy tales. This poetry collection examines feminism, anti-capitalism, trauma, and healing within this, within this framework and leaves no stone from the path unturned. Each of these 57 poems is an excavation, an attempt to flip over the story and explore the crawling creatures living on the other side. Loom. One, beds of straw and beds of gold. Women who spin and cannot be still. The name of the helper, the name of the blackmailer. Coffins of straw and coffins of gold. The spinning wheels of mention in the 14th century. The drop spindle, documented as existing as far back as the first century. Two, the gold chain around her neck and the invisible ones on her wrists. The nauseous smell of metal on her finger. Spinning as a social activity, performed alongside stories in the evening the industrial revolution and the transubstantiation of the fabric industry into the hands of men. The origin of the word spinster. Three, cutting the thread of life in one tight snip, blades that dull from overuse on metal. The moment of death as determined by the work of woman, or in this case, a dwarf. Restored to life. One, a soldier and a princess are wed, vowing to be buried together when one dies. At the wedding feast, they eat their fill of meats and wines, pushing their bodies to the limit. When they kiss, the rest of the world dissolves. Death is an invisible guest, hiding in the princess's smile and in the curves of her stomach. Months later, they kiss for the last time. The princess dies with empty eyes and hands. Two, in the tomb, the soldier resurrects the princess. When their hands have properly bruised against the stone, they are released from the tomb. Citizens from throughout the kingdom come to witness this miracle. The princess's hand trembles in the soldiers, and when no one is looking, she pulls it away. On the rare occasions that they kiss, her lips are waxy and cold. Three, the princess kills the soldier. His body sinks into the ocean. That night, for the first time since her death, the princess sleeps. Four, the soldier is resurrected and has the princess drowned. Her body has been left for the hagfish, but the original tomb still stands where it always did. Some days, the soldier wanders through it, listening to the echo of his own footsteps. The floor is littered with rose petals and empty snakeskins. The witch dies, a triptych. In the stories of princesses, we see the ways in which women attempt to take control of their own lives. For example, Morgan Le Fay studies with the sorcerer Merlin as a way to take back agency after Uther Pendragon. However, Pendragon is lauded as a great king. Morgan as a mere witch. In the Grimm stories, Snow White runs away from a wicked stepmother. With regards to these tales, it is important to take a wider view and also examine the role of the prince, discussed on page. As Marina Warner points out, the voice of the male speaker often disguises itself as the benign form of Mother Goose. 
The ladies of the lake provide another example. Girlhood can only exist in these two modes. The folklore hero has his sword, while witchcraft provides the one alternative. The hero either, heroine either swallows her feelings or is consumed by them. The woman who stabs does so with a needle. In what ways do we come to understand the folklore heroine? In counterpoint, I do feel compelled to point out that many folk tales have yet to be discovered by English readers and may provide. Princess. Studies with. Great. Witch. Runs away. With. The prince. Disguises. Self as. Lake. Girl. Has. Sword. Witch. Swallows her. Consumed. Woman stabs way out. Princess studies with great witch, runs away with the prince, disguises self as lake. Girl has sword, witch swallows her. Consumed woman stabs way out. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. I love hearing you read. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Riley Danvers. Uh, she is the author of Even the Air Too Heavy. And uh, here is a little bit about her book. When the body becomes a monument of loss, the self must navigate a vast internal space, not on the world's timeline, but in its own circadian cadences. Riley Danvers' collection, Even the Air Too Heavy, wayfinds through the emptiness of miscarriage with words and experimental forms that examine the vacated, the absent, the lost. What is not on the page is as devastating as the recounting. In a world of how-tos and what-nexts, Danvers' collection lives in the timelessness of tides and patterns where the self drifts long, as long as it takes for a path of healing to emerge. Welcome, Riley. Thank you, Caroline. Becoming a haven. My body, like a groan, can't be less than it isn't. A tree or tail or body of scales, the creek, furled wings, unfurling howls. My body, like a tree, can't move without groaning, groans without knowing why, sways under gravity of unflapped wings, bends and arches under starstruck tempests. I don't like how my body moves. My body moves like groans have grown roots and roots have grown wings. Hot angst in bones, the wind roams among scales and leaves, arcing under beastling tracks and forest fire. What to expect when you're expecting death. I am losing this pregnancy. It's what my body says must happen, declaring mutiny on this unborn brew of my DNA. Body blows open a grief-shaped hole in my once birth, now unbirth canal. I feel death like an alter ego. My dying light never lived. Empty sonogram, blank womb. I have no more rage to rage with. I cannot stop the flow. River veins. I want to lie down like a river, lie down in a river, lie down and become a river because this body is static and maybe then I'll understand the concept of movement. I want to lie down like a river, Lie down near a river, lie down and watch a river because this body is rigid 
full of mountain peaks, and maybe then I'll know the reason for air. I want to lie down like a river, lie down close to a river, lie down and listen to a river, because there is magic and memory in water, and maybe then I'll remember the me that emerged from the sea. I want to lie down like a river, lie down in the woods like a river, lie down and breathe in the wind like a river, because this body aches and creeps, and maybe then I'll hold more in my hands than an offering of scars. I want to lie down like a river, lie down and dream of the river, lie down and merge with the river, because this body is no longer tethered, and maybe I don't need to walk on water to understand doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Riley. Um, I want to I want to say here that um, it was a real honor for me to work on both Riley's book and the book I'm about to introduce, Sonia Wallace's book, One Row After. It was a real highlight of my spring to work on these two books. They were both deeply moving in completely different ways, and I just thank you both for your work uh, and the time I could spend with it. So Sonia Wallace is the author of One Row After, Beer Sira Sonra. And this is what we have to say about this book. In times of crisis, when our faculty for language fails, we wait for the oracle to speak in other modes, through visions, memories, in languages of our past and future. Secret messages rise to guide us from a fractured state to a place of agency. The vivid and eloquent poems in Sonia Wallace's debut collection, One Row After, Beer Sierra Sonra, take readers on a journey beyond rows of ordered language through Polaroid memories, earth-toned landscapes, the indigo cosmos, the soft steps of sock feet down corridors, and into the benevolent embrace of a new healing dim dimension. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Carolyn, so much for that um, lovely introduction. And thank you to everyone for being here and for um, attending our reading. 926.5, one, walking through the hallways, socked feet and wet hair, I come across these figures from time to time. They ask questions indirectly, awaiting an opening, an asterisk. Wanting to see. <laughs> Sorry, my son is here. Wanting to see if I'll reaffirm my faith or establish communion. I always know the answer, but when they press further, I break down. Tongue hammering to glottal stop. I surface crash, intend response, and yet my knowledge of even myself has its animal limits. So that is not to say this is a failure. Two, for every question I can't answer, there is a trajectory. Whispered chords admonishing, plus thick mosses blooming their cold compass across all surfaces. And I am in this way surrounded by the dense unyielding arrangement of particles, frays in the fibers, clusters of calcifications, and a wandering fever. Three, after a while, they supply helpfully something along the lines of, these are the words for mountain in another language. See them gouging into atmospheres alongside a wreck of turquoise. Before this, there were the arrangements of maps, vehicles and salt marshes, small insipid fish that knew nothing but the fogged hope of netting. They swam in the cistern of stagnant patterns we could have learned to survive. I ask for them scale by scale and refer to the small evidences along the clay capture as nemnocene. And we drift forward the remotioned haze. Four, when I conclude the sky slide, they answer, this is a quarter moon and place it in my mouth. Nine. 
929.9. The body felt it was a table for fur and other minute supplements, both mineral and animal, in the cold climate that arrived in tatters, hungry and ready to set its teeth into anything. There beside the body sat the stone, perhaps flint or church rather. It paced the nanoseconds and wait for the body to take it into itself again as body, to chip away at the sunrise one more time. How strong and mighty a hand that touched itself to this task, hard like a plank of cedar or a slicing feather, bent to nothing but the damp hope of body. The body cut itself with itself. Something came cold and clear like ruin. Then the body sent packages, gifts of apology for what it had done in that moment of the body. The offerings arrived quickly, all bound together and clotted up with glue and platelets as if that were to suffice for urgency. For days, the body didn't cry about what it had done. Two weeks later, the festering body sang out in the dark for a hot iron, a pinch of salt, and a steel moon in which to sink itself afterward. The body answered and it arrived there both cold and shallow. The body set about to knit another body from within. It started with small goals, milestones with which to congratulate itself along the way. Research, an important thing for the body. To measure itself against the body's idea of growth and development. This was the inevitable path to new body becoming which was nothing less than good ground. The body first opened all the valves along this terrain, one course of body and then another. This affected a great spill of accelerant over everything, the body and itself. A spark of something, perhaps a tension, caught the edge of the body and zipped the chert into a feasting yellow flame. This fire warmed the body nicely. The body had been so cold. The body at last latched itself onto the warmth, just as it had hoped to, but had never imagined it would do in that lifetime. From that moment on, the body set about pulling away its precious furs, one follicle for every ice age. Nine twenty-seven point five. It's been four years, and I don't know why I'm here again buried and clouded in the exhaust that comes with miming a decision that could have been made 50 years ago or perhaps 5,000. I gaze at my fingers long and cold as they pull at the green feathers of the verbena plant and crush them in circular gestures. A fragrance erupts a certain solace that I can't comprehend. I pace around this place in search of pens, paper, or crayons, nothing extravagant, something ready for the same fingers to grasp. The patients don't realize it, but the doctors walk around each wing, each hallway, each room to bless this place, to bless the patients themselves, every day of every week of every year. Glaciers shift beneath the weight of their knowing. Dust settles on the furniture and is swept away. An owl enters an abandoned shed and a bright cord in its right brain seeks through layers of dry rot for the warmest place to nest. I want to learn how to hear with my body, to keep pushing beyond the oracle. And a friend asks if someone can tell him how he got here. It's been months and no one can say. He asks the doctors and nurses every day and they can't tell him the answer he needs with their voices. And he repeats the story of how his grandfather would gather the children and tell them the story of all creation. He tells us the story of how his grandfather always held his cane in his right hand, how it was that when he would have need of it, it would appear in his right hand. Beneath the central air, he speaks in a steady voice. Outside, air currents coax in the first rains of the season. A nurse nods in agreement and turns their listening inward. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, Sonia. Um, and I just wanna get us all started as we're all getting up on the video here. And I thought I would kick us off with a first question. So, um, and then after that, the conversation will go where it goes. Um, and so the question we're starting off with is, 
are some types of content easier to tackle in poetry and other types in prose? I mean, I certainly think so, but I do a lot of report writing for a living. So I have to look at data and, um, you know, program outcomes. And so I write, I don't know, well, it's obviously not literary, but, you know, I'm trying to construct a narrative about how things work in a time function um, in a structured way. And the way my brain works when I'm in the poetry mode is just so different. So yeah, for me, it definitely, the, the content really will differ <laughs> depending on what mode I'm in. Although, you know, sometimes I, I find it interesting, like if I read like a scientific paper or, um, or some philosophy and then start, you start getting into the poet, like poet poetry brain and see how it, how it differs as it comes out. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. One thing that's coming to my mind right now is the concept of like conversations that are easier to have when it's dark. And I think about like when you're out, especially outside in the dark with people and there's conversations that just flow in really different ways than they ever could in the daytime. And so I think it's partially about like what spaces we're creating and what we you know, what comes into those spaces is partially what space we are creating. And poetry is a space that I think invites a lot in. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I, in my experience, poetry definitely, like there's some content that is easier to write about with poetry. Um, I don't know if it's that poetry allows for things to be less literal um, or if it's that poetry allows kind of a more like deconstructed way of, you know, creating things on the page. Um, but I definitely feel um, for this book, um, I, I had tried writing about my miscarriages in prose um, quite a bit. And while I definitely still liked those pieces, I, I don't feel like those pieces got as close to the actual experience of, of miscarriage um, as, as poetry did. Um, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. See, I'm thinking about uh, the conversation we had last time about trauma and poetry and how a lot of the time uh, the works you're talking about made use of negative space to invoke the trauma. And I wonder if that shortcut something in the brain even that by the reader having to go through that and see it in negative space rather than just said plainly, if that you know evokes it in more of a feeling sense and shortcuts some of the literal interpretation. Yeah, and I, I find it interesting, Riley, with your work. Um, I love how you explore the feeling of like being disembodied, but then trying to find yourself in your body again through language. And I just, I love listening to the poem about being becoming a river because it was so rhythmic and you're talking about like merging with the natural landscape or how your body, you, you want your body to become a part of the natural landscape and it produces this rhythm with the language that is like very grounding and it's like very rhythmic and very soothing. Um, and I think a lot, you know, like with trauma, you know, and the, the sensation of being like separate from your body and how do you find your way back and what's the way to do that? And I just, that poem was such a beautiful way to show like, okay, we can do this through language and through visualization of, of how I would like myself to be part of the world around me. And, yeah, I find it amazing how language does that. And it's very, it's very ritualistic too. Um, you know, and a lot of like religious and spiritual traditions, there will be like poetry or singing or um, rhythms that really serve an important function to bring out of, bring us out of a certain state of being and into like a connection with each other and with the world around us. And so poetry is a naturally ritualistic, I think, 
practice um, that allows us to do that. So, yeah, I think it um, in, in terms of the content, when we experience these massive traumas in our life or periods of transition, I, I also think, you know, maybe our modern society really lacks a lot of the grounded rituals that have been such an important part of um, human evolution for thousands of years that the poetry allows us to do that. See, that makes me think about the folktale too, and like the oral folktale as a re precursor to the literary fairy tale, which is something I explored a lot in the research for my book. But I do think there is something that we are really, that we really crave and don't necessarily have enough of in our current society. And I think it's exactly what you're talking about. And like with um, your piece, the triptych, I, I love that piece because you're moving from like this academic prose. I mean, you come across as somebody that really likes to do a lot of research and a lot of academic <laughs> research, you know, it can be, it's fascinating and it's beautiful, but it can be, you know, very dry and sort of lacking in that emotional connection. But I think it's super important. Um, I, you know, I think it's amazing the people that go and research the histories of, of where these um, stories come from. And so you're moving from this sort of academic mind, but then there's little breaks in that piece, in that first part where, you know, you have the ellipses and it's like, you're starting to move in towards a more poetic mind frame. And as you move through the poem, you uncover something new from, from that process. I, I just thought that was really neat. Well, it's so funny in that piece, I know when I first read it to the group for workshop when it was still in progress, uh, the second part was the hardest part for me to read out loud where it's all spaced differently and you have the erasure and it's not put back together yet. But the more I've practiced reading out loud, the more that becomes my favorite part. And I think it's because of some of that disembodiedness and moving away from something that is too structured, which is often more my comfort zone. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm loving all of this. Um, and uh, Sonia, when you were talking about how um, poetry um, is, is kind of ritualistic, it, it made me think there's, I can't remember his name, um, but there was a, a playwright um, who uh, in an interview said that for him, writing is like prayer. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, poetry is very much the prayer. Um, and that's obviously part of like the, the ritualistic experience, but I, I think, I think you're right. I think poetry touches something that is sacred, something that's divine, something that's, I mean, dare I even say supernatural, um, that I, I don't know, it's, I, I definitely agree with you, um, that poetry does kind of take us out of the, the literal and the, um, maybe the academic and into something more spiritual. And I love the way that when I'm thinking or writing poetry or I, I get in, and I, it happens to me a lot in this time, right as I'm falling asleep, um, where all of a sudden there's this like flood of words or language that is coming to, and a lot of times it doesn't really make sense, but that's the nice thing about poetry is it doesn't necessarily have to make sense. And it's like your brain is just doing all kinds of stuff that I don't even know what, what's going on. But, um, and you can just like allow yourself to settle into it. Um, and I find I go times like long periods sometimes where I don't really write much poetry because I'm busy or I'm really focused on something else. And then I'll have times when I get really into it and it's like, I have to almost allow myself to just sink into it. And it's like, a, it's like a practice, like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, because my normal everyday functioning brain is like, go to the store, get groceries, clean the house, you know, go to work. Um, so poetry allows me to get out of that. And it's like, it takes focused acceptance mm -hmm. um, for me. And I don't know, I just, I think it's so cool. And in fact, a lot of like things um, that I've written as poetry have come to me, like either in that pre-dream state or during a dream state. Um, and I don't know. I just think that's an important part of ourselves to keep alive. It's really interesting that you say that because in my MFA, one of our mentors, um, he's a Japanese American poet. Um, his name is Brandon Shimoda, 
um, he actively encouraged the students studying with him to keep a notepad and paper next to them in bed um, for when they got into that kind of like pre-dream state, kind of awake, kind of asleep. Um, and he used it as a meditative practice to um, connect with his ancestors. Mm -hmm. um, but he like passed it on to the students as like a meditative writing practice. Um, he said, you know, maybe you will connect with someone from your past or maybe you'll connect to something um, in a creative space that you wouldn't have before. Um, so it's interesting that, that you brought that up because it was, it was part of um, several students um, study in, in my MFA. So one of the things this conversation is making me think about too, and Riley, I'd be curious for your take on this because I know you also write fiction as well as poetry. Uh, Sonia, I actually, I'm not sure whether you write fiction or not, so feel free to chime in as well. But one thing that I notice is that, well, both fiction and poetry are things that like I can do as a practice. It feels like poetry a lot of the time needs more breathing room. And there's a lot of, a lot of the time I'll just find that a poem is not ready yet. And, you know, I can write as a practice every day, but I may have to set that poem aside for months or years because it's not ready and it's not going to be ready in a way that with fiction is very different because with fiction, I feel like I can push through. I can be like, well, what strategies do I know? You know, what have I learned about how to evoke this sort of thing? What can I test out? What can I experiment with? Can I show this to a friend and get their take? And again, with poetry, sometimes there's just a hard stop. Sometimes I just have to be like, this poem is not ready to be written yet in a way that I feel like does touch on some of the ritualistic, more spiritual practice of poetry. But I'm curious if y'all experience that as well. 100%. <laughs> yes, that is my literal experience in the difference between fiction and poetry. Um, for the longest time, I thought that I couldn't write poetry um, because I would get so stuck. Like, revising prose was such a straightforward process, often tedious and monotonous, but it was still very straightforward and I, I knew what my end goal was. Um, revising poetry for years was just, it made no sense to me. I didn't know how to revise a poem. And for a long time just decided I must not be a poet. Um, and so yeah, I, I relate very strongly to that. I, I have only written like some short stories, like I'll get an idea for a story. Um, and for me, it's usually a stamina thing with the short story writing. Like I have an idea of the arc of the narrative and like the kind of characters. Um, so it's like, like you said, just pushing through and like getting it done and then editing and cleaning it up. Um, yeah, but I agree like poetry, I don't know. Sometimes like I've tried to write poems and they just don't work. And then I'll come, like you said, come back to it years later and maybe have a breakthrough or just some poems, they just are like a way for me to get things out, but it's not ever going to actually come to anything. Um, and I, same as you, Riley, I, for a long time, I didn't think I was a poetry writer. Um, I always enjoyed poetry and thought it was amazing and admired people who did write poetry, but I never thought I was a poet. In fact, I had somebody tell me when I was in college that I couldn't be a poet. Um, this person, I don't know. Anyways, forget about that person. Um, so for a long time, I didn't, I didn't think it was something I could do, but um, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of stopped caring and just kept writing and yeah. See, that's so funny to hear because I also for a long time did not think I was a poet and kind of, you know, kept stumbling into writing poetry accidentally until it's stuck. So that's very interesting that we all had that experience. And like that person can pound sand, Sonia. Like, yeah, oh my God. you have a book coming out this fall. So prove them wrong. <laughs> and it's beautiful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting how I, I guess to our education system, I don't know, it's I know in other countries, like there's a lot more appreciation and emphasis on poetry. Um, I, I lived in Latin America for a number of years in different countries. And in a lot of Latin American countries, poetry is very much appreciated and widely celebrated. And um, like everybody writes poetry and it's just a part of culture. 
I feel like in the United States, it's not, it's like kind of like a fringe thing. Like it's not very, not many people read poetry. Not many people are interested in poetry. It's just, you know, part of the literature syllabus and okay, we got to read this poem and then we got to, we're going to read these novels. But I think there's a lot more emphasis placed on writing that accomplishes like a concrete task in the world. And um, I actually heard a, my, one of my favorite poets, Joy Harjo, she says that poetry accomplishes, she's like a lot of poems, like they are meant to accomplish something. But I think because our culture doesn't really appreciate poetry, they see it as kind of like useless or um, what does it do? It doesn't make money or I don't know. So and also, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I'm thinking about like the pace of our culture. Like America is very fast paced and poetry demands that you slow down. So true. That's very true. Yeah, my, um, the director of my MFA program said that poets don't need agents because the only people who read poetry are poets. <laughs> um, and as, as heartbreaking as that was to hear coming out of an MFA in poetry. Um, I also am, I don't know, like I'm kind of grateful in a way that there isn't like as much fanfare around poetry um, because you know, every poet is, is so unique and different. Um, and I feel like a lot of fiction tends to be the same thing, just kind of recycled over and over. So um, I, I think for me, poetry feels a little bit more um, open and, and maybe even a little less defined than, than prose, um, almost like it holds more opportunity for creative expression. Well, and that also makes me think, you know, poetry makes a lot less money than fiction. So to a certain extent, it's like, if you're not going to make money anyway, you might as well write what you want. Exactly. <laughs> <in the market. laughs> exactly. I definitely agree. You know, um, well, it's something interesting because I see that like Haley writes in, in form a lot. Um, and I've tried writing like sestinas and sonnets. I'm not very good at it yet. Um, so I tend to do a lot of like free verse and just make things up. And I love that about poetry that there are these traditional forms um, that I do think, I, one of my favorite poets, she writes in form a lot. And she says that that kind of allows her to arrive at places that she wouldn't if there wasn't this like imposed form on her. But I love that about poetry that some people are going to be attracted to form poetry and some maybe to free verse or like experimental and even visual poems. I mean, there's just so many different things you can do with poetry based on your interests and your, you know, what calls to you. And I just, yeah, I think it's great. And Sonia, I love that you said that you can't do it yet because I can just, I can tell from your writing, you've got, you've got some sustainers in you. You've got some sonnets in you. Like, when your poetry is ready to come out in form, it's going to be a kick ass. <laughs> oh, thanks. I just, I, I think I've gained a lot more appreciation for form, po form poetry writing. Um, I just, I don't know. I'm just amazed by people that write in form poetry. It's because they, the, it's like weaving. It just comes together and it's just so remarkable. Um, yeah, so I think it's really cool that you do that. Well, I think it's amazing how much like the rest of y'all can do free verse because one of the reasons I'm drawn to form is because with free verse, I'm way too inclined to just say what I mean. And so sometimes I need to have the restraint so that I don't just say it straightforwardly, which I guess brings us back to like difference between prose and poetry, right? Like for me, writing, I have some poems in my book that are written in free verse and I'm very proud of them, but they took a lot more work in some ways than the other ones because it was really hard for me to not just say exactly what I meant. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm manifesting for both of us, Sonia. Um, you've got a book of Sestinas and I've got a book of Sonnets where <laughs> we'll, we'll get there at some point. <laughs> no, I, I really love that, Haley. That's really interesting. Um, I'm not sure I have anything to add. I'm just, I'm kind of like mulling over what you said about form kind of restricting the way you use language. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's really fascinating. I also just like, I love meter and rhyme. I love the way they sound. And like, it just like scratches an itch in my brain when like a rhyme comes out exactly how it should, especially when it's got a really strong rhythm to it. Oh, it's amazing. It like, it gets you, it, it like, yeah, it takes you into another place, especially when you hear it read aloud. It's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is so great. And like a lot of times, um, like you can't even tell that this, all this intricate behind the scenes work went into it because it comes out, it's just so beautiful. And um, I think there's something that is just naturally attractive about, about the meter rhymes and the way it kind of moves together. Then you realize, oh, this person probably worked on this poem for maybe years to get it to work out like this, but here it is, it's so beautiful. So one thing I am curious about, just because I know for this reading in particular, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Uh, why did you choose the poems you chose? I, I chose the poems that I chose because I felt that they were um, uh, like more poetic. Um, I have, I had two poems that were um, a little bit more rhythmic, um, had either the use of repetition or some kind of like almost rhyming schemes kind of woven throughout. Um, and I felt that they were a little different than the other poems that I had read for the other two conversations. And for me, I think I chose two poems that, well, they're like prose poems because of the theme of our conversation. And then the first poem I read, um, because it had some like visual elements. So in some of the poems in my book, I, it's, you know, if you hear it just read aloud and you don't see it on the page, I think the, the visual aspect maybe um, changes it a little bit or I don't know, adds something or makes the experience different. So I thought, oh, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll do that one. So we can maybe discuss about, you know, the visuals. I, I, I think a lot of us in our books, we use like erasures or spaces or different kinds of, I don't know, designs on the page, which I think, I don't know, I, I really enjoy that. What about you, Haley? Why did you choose yours? So for mine, I knew right away that I wanted to do uh, the triptych poem, The Witch Dies, because that was one that actually started as the final part of the triptych. It was written like somewhat in form. I was originally using a form where it was three, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was. It was three syllables per line, three lines per stanza, three stanzas. And it's actually no longer quite like that because uh, in the revision process, Zylo suggested making it a reverse erasure. And as I did that, I just felt the poem open up in a really unexpected way. But as a result, I wrote some just like kind of random academic prose, you know, like this wasn't an erasure where I took an existing thing and turned it into a poem. I had to take this poem and create academic prose around it. And so I just oh. thought that was really interesting for this conversation. That is so interesting. That's amazing. I didn't know you went backwards like that. That is so cool. That's yeah. Incredible. It's like one of those amazing things that just comes from the collaborative process because I never would have thought to do this, but now it's one of my favorite poems in the book just from how it turned out. And then the yeah. others, I was picking things that I felt like were kind of hybrid in terms of prose and poetry. And I have, you know, for every for every story that I work with in this collection, I have one of the poems that's formatted like this with the numbers and the short descriptions of the fairy tale. And that was something that came up very early in my process because as I started researching the fairy tales like years ago when I first started this, um, I discovered the ATU system which has brief synopses of like the tale type. So it'll have like, you know, a couple sentences that, and it's just like, these are the things that are a part of this tale type. And I thought that was so interesting to have them in those really short forms. And, you know, I just ended up, you know, taking those and writing this prose poetry in the middle and it ended up being, I mean, I think it's a really integral part of what makes this collection what it is. And they're some of my favorite poems, but they're also very much like not either form poetry or free verse. Like there's something, 
they're closer to prose poetry than anything else, but they're not quite that either. So I like having one of these in every set that I read because they're so integral to the book, but I also felt like for this specifically, I was like, yeah, this is like kind of a weird hybrid form. Yeah, it's interesting because you're building on the, I don't know, it sounds like academic tradition of classifying these myths and fairy tales. And it's like this, you're saying this in, a, in and of itself is almost a poetic form, but it's just been an academic tradition. So you're exploring it as poetry, even though it's like academic prose. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I did a lot of research for this collection, which was very fun and different than how my usual poetic process is, especially. But this started this started several years ago uh, in college as part of my um, my honors thesis, my senior year. And most of the people, it was English honors broadly, so not just creative writing, but also literature. So we were required to do like an academic component for one of the quarters where it was just like all research based. So I ended up doing, again, a lot more research than I usually do for writing poetry. And then as I worked on this more, you know, after that, because I, I didn't write this whole book as part of that, I just wrote part of this for the thesis. Um, but I just got really into the research and kept doing more and more of it. Yeah, I think that's something that's interesting to me too, is um, I really enjoy research. I've always loved research. And I think a lot of people assume that poets don't do research or they don't, you know, read articles or study a theme or, you know, talk to people. Um, but we do. We do research. Every single poet I know <laughs> does so much research. <laughs> well, and I feel like there's kind of this myth of like the poet in the garret who just like wakes up in the morning and writes something down and it's perfect the way it is and nothing gets revised and there's no research that goes into it. And that if you're not writing that way, if you're doing lots of revisions, if you're doing lots of research and things like that, somehow it's not pure or, you know, sacred in the way that we've talked about poetry as being. But I mean, as we've just established, we all do that. That's actually a very important part of the process, but it's not kind of in the mythos of what a poet is. Yeah, it's it's really interesting too what you, because um, it brings me back to your comment about sometimes it takes years and years for poems to incubate. Um, and I, I had a research project I did, it's been, gosh, five years now since I did that. And I feel like I couldn't write anything um, prose about it, what I did. And I, I'm, I, but I'm so attracted to that material. And I'm just like, I know it's waiting to come out and it's probably going to come out as some like poems or some unexpected, I don't know. Yeah. So it's exciting. I don't know. It's just kind of cool to see how things come into your mind, you're reading other people's ideas or their research, or you heard something and it just kind of maybe over years, it like, it stays there and it goes underground and like decomposes and then it comes back as something else. It's so cool. All right, my friends, we are coming up on the hour here. So I'll just um, give you a chance if there's any else, anything else lingering for you, any final questions or comments you have for your fellow poets, now would be a good time. Well, I'm very excited to read everyone's final collection next month. Me too. Okay. 100%. Yeah, it's been a marvelous process and I, I don't know, it's, sometimes it's hard to believe that we're almost there. You know, we've been through a lot of revisions and a lot of editing and um, it's so exciting. It is for sure. Almost, almost unbelievable. In a way. <laughs> <laughs> this kind of brings up a question for me, if I can ask a question. Um, so yeah, the, the books are finished. They're, we're going to have our big release party next month and there'll be some readings and everything, but people keep writing. So what are y'all working on these days? Uh, I just finished what I hope is the final draft of my gay horror fantasy novel. Uh, I 
am very excited about something I've been working on for a couple of years now. Uh, Riley, it was actually originally uh, I wrote a magician's fanfic and then I was like, I could turn this into something totally different. And I did. And it's very dissimilar to that now, but that is how it started. Did it start uh, with um, did it start with Elliot and Quentin? No, it did not. It started with Margot and Alice. I'll send you the fic. Yes, anyway. <laughs> um, I, but yeah, I've been working on it for a while and it's fairy tale based horror fantasy and it's very weird and very lyrical and very just like all the things I love and like hoping, you know, I'm starting to query agents with this one, but I'm also like, even if nothing comes of it, I'm so glad I wrote this. Cause like, it's my favorite thing I've written in fiction so far. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm um, <laughs> also working on um, what I originally thought was going to be a novella, but is now turning into a full-fledged novel, um, and I have to accept that. Um, and it is also a um, horror uh, fairy tale novel. Um, it's a retelling of Cinderella, um, where Cinderella is a necromancer and an assassin. So I'm, I'm excited about it. It is still very, very rough. It is not ready to send out in any way, shape or form. So you're way ahead of me. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm also got like plans in my brain for um, a second book of poetry, but haven't really sat down to put that together yet or started. So that's where I am. And um, for me, I, well, there's a project that I've kind of had in the back of my mind for a while now. Um, I haven't worked a whole lot on it lately, but it will probably be a combination of um, poetry and maybe some really short stories. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll probably be a while before I get very far with it. Well, I'm excited. These all sound like cool projects. And I feel like, I mean, because like we are all together for these first books that we have coming out, I kind of feel like we're going to be weaving in and out of each other's lives and careers for a long time, which I'm really excited about. Absolutely. The community aspect of this process has been everything. Absolutely everything. And we have awesome editors. Who yes. Have been so supportive and helpful and just amazing. 100%. I was going to say, the other thing I've been working on is these mini collages to promote my book and just finish this I one for tomorrow. I love them, by the way. I adore them. They're amazing. <laughs> Thank I you. love seeing them on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> I'm having a lot of fun with them. I don't go back to work till next week nice. since I work in a school. So I've had all this time and I love making collages. And I was like, you know, I, I get tired of just posting over and over like, hey, buy my book. I might as well have like something. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> Beautiful time to transition and tell you all about where you can get your hands on these books. So I'll share my screen here. And um, we do have pre-orders available on the First Matter Press website. So if you head over there, you'll see 2022 pre-orders. Um, all of the proceeds go directly to our authors. And by pre-ordering a book, you're really telling them that you're excited about it and helping them kind of get this book um, on its way in the world in a really good way. Um, we'll be announcing uh, more details about our uh, release event that's going to happen in September um, through our different um, community channels. So if you're on our mailing list or our social feeds, you should see more info about that there if you'd like to join us live in Portland, Oregon. And we also are announcing that just today we opened our reading period um, for our next 2023 and 2024 cohorts. So if you've been working on a collection or you're a first time publishing author or you're working on something genre expanding, we'd love to see what you're up to. And you can find more about that in the submit tab on the First Matter Press website. Um, and that's all done through Submittable. So I think that's all I have.